Hello, my name's Lindsay Turnbull and I'm an Associate Professor in the Department of Plant Sciences at the University of Oxford. And we're right in the middle of this very serious coronavirus crisis right now. And my students are all stuck at home and we want to keep them in touch with biology and keep them in touch with us. And so we're going to make a new series of videos and they're going to be called Back Garden Biology. Today we are going on safari, garden safari of course. Now when people go on safari they're often obsessed with seeing what are known as the big five and those are the five biggest animals that you can find in an African national park. Now, it's a very childish thing to do in a way because the size of an animal has nothing to do with how interesting it is, or how cool it is, or how colourful it is. So I like all things, it doesn't matter how big they are. But I'm going to apply my big five to the insect world, so I'm going to call them the bug five. Now identifying insects, as we've seen, is difficult because there's so many species. But the best starting point is to think about the insect orders. So orders of insects are a grouping that comes, there's the high level grouping just below the insect groups. We can call something an insect and then we want to assign it to an order. And an order might be something like the beetles, they are an order. So which are the big five insect orders? Well, let's have a look at this book first. This is that amazing Paul Brock's insect guide that I told you about. On the right hand side here are all the insects from just five orders and on the left hand side is basically all the rest. So you can see just how big the big five are. In terms of numbers of species, there are really only five orders that absolutely dominate the insect world. I've got a hawthorn here. This is a great place. A big flowering tree like this is a great place to start looking for insects, especially because it's a native tree. So loads of things will want to eat it, come to its flowers. And we're going to look through those five orders and find out what exactly characterises each one. And then I'm going to put together my garden big five, not just from the groupings, but actually five individual species chosen, each one from each of those groups find out whether my big five, well how does it hold up against your big five? So in at number five, with just 1800 species in the UK, are the true bugs and their Latin name is the Hemiptera. All insect orders are the something terra, P-T-E-R-A, and that means wings. So their distinguishing characteristics are the arrangement of the wings and that's one of the things that we'll be looking closely at. So what's characteristic of a true bug, a hemiptera? Well again, a Pandora Jew and a former student has done some wonderful drawings for us. Let's have a look at the one of the hemiptera. So this is a classic hemiptera. It's actually a shield bug uh, and that's quite commonly found in gardens. And if we look at the left hand diagram, we can sort of see where the hemiptera comes from. Right, so hemiptera really means hemiptera, half wing, part wing. And that's because the wings are partly hardened at the top, but the bottom part of the wing is membranous. And that gives them that rather unusual look. You can see it's very different from a beetle, which we'll see in a moment. A beetle has, it always has a clear line down here. This has a much more sort of complicated arrangement because of these unusual wings. Now the biggest group of hemipterans are the aphids and the scale insects. And if you want to see a true bug and you wander out into your garden right now, I can absolutely guarantee that you will be able to find an aphid. Not all of them have wings uh, at this time of year, especially aphids have a really extraordinary life cycle. So quite a lot of aphids don't have any wings at all, but you might be able to find a winged one. Uh, and they of course are sucking the sap of plants. And let's have a look closely at the mouth parts of the bugs and see what they're up to. So they have this amazing piercing rostrum and very often they stick that rostrum into plants and suck the sap of plants like the aphids or indeed the shield bug. Uh, and common examples in gardens are the green shield bug, which we can see here. And that's often found on hawthorn or various shrubs. I also found this box bug wandering around that used to be an incredibly rare insect. But since 1990, it's been spreading out across southern England and now is quite easy to find. 
These piercing mouth parts are not only used to suck the sap of plants. Some insects suck blood, of course, and bugs are no exception. Think about bed bugs, they are a true bug. But there are also bugs that suck the sap, if you like, of other insects. They can pierce into the hard exoskeleton and suck out the juicy contents. And that's a group of bugs called the assassin bugs. So that's the bugs, and they're in at number five. So coming in at number four, with around two and a half thousand species in the UK, are the butterflies and moths, which are the Lepidoptera. And Lepidoptera means scale wings. And we're all quite familiar with those beautiful patterns and colours that those scales can create on our most exotic looking butterflies. And we've got some pretty great ones in the UK. Let's have a close look at one of Pandora's drawings. She's chosen to draw the large white butterfly, who's probably one of the least popular uh, members of the group in Britain because, of course, they lay their eggs on cabbages. And butterflies and moths normally are quite specific about the food plants for the larvae, hunting out maybe just one species that the caterpillars then eat. The mouth parts are pretty extraordinary. They have this amazing long proboscis that they can coil up like that. And we can see that probing into the flowers here. So they're really good at feeding on flowers with long corolla tubes where the insects have to reach down deep to get to the nectar. And lots of flowers have adapted so that they only want to be pollinated by butterflies and moths. Lots of people want to know what's the difference between a butterfly and a moth. Quite difficult to know. Quite a lot of um, moths are actually day flying. In the UK, the antennae are pretty characteristic. If they have a club on the end like this, then it's a butterfly. If it's a more feathery looking structure, then it's almost certainly a moth. You can't necessarily apply that worldwide, but it works quite well for our butterflies. What you can also see is sometimes the way they sit at rest. So unless they're basking, a butterfly tends to shut its wings up and hold them above its body like that, as we can see with this holly blue here. Uh, but moths will tend to put the wings out flat. In at number three, surprisingly, I think, is the coleoptera or beetles. Now, beetles are famous for being mega diverse, but actually in the UK, there's around 4,100 species, and that's considerably less than the last two groups that we're still to look at. Now, the beetles are called the coleoptera, and that means sheath wings. And let's have a quick look at this diagram from Pandora, and we'll see why they're called that. So again, all insects have two pairs of wings. In the beetles, the four wings have been modified into something called elytra, and those are hard wing cases. And the hind pair of wings is membranous and is tucked and folded away beneath those elytra to keep them safe and undamaged. And we can see this in this ladybird as it takes off from my hand, and you can see it unpacking the hind wings and whizzing off. Now, for the mouth parts, a lot of coleoptera have large chewing mandibles. Not all of them, but a lot of them are predatory. And of course, we are very well disposed as gardeners towards beetles because a special kinds of them are really helpful towards gardeners. Obviously, the ladybirds being one. And here there is roaming around a rose plant looking for aphids to eat. And their larvae are particularly voracious aphid predators. The other kind of beetle that is really helpful to the garden are the ground beetles. Uh, some of them can be really large and they're very fast active moving predators like this one that I managed to get a very brief glimpse of as it scuttled away. They're nocturnal, they don't like being active during the day so they're hard to get hold of but they're really good predators. You can tell something's predatory normally as an insect just from the rate it moves. If it goes rushing away from you at high speed then it's probably an active hunter. In at number two, the diptera, or the true flies. Diptera means die, terror, two wings. Of course, they don't really have two wings, but they have really specially adapted hind wings that make them the supreme flyers. Let's have a, t a closer look. This is actually a drosophila, a fruit fly, something that most of us are familiar with in the summer as they swarm around the bananas in our kitchens. The four wings you see is a membranous wing, and that is the hind wing, this tiny little structure here. It's called a hole tear, and it's a balance organ. It's covered in little sensory hairs, and it's really a, an insect marvel. And it allows the flies to be spectacularly good flyers. And as the best thing insect to see them on is a crane fly, or daddy long legs. If you can look closely at a daddy long legs, you have a good chance of being able to see these. They're very tiny on a lot of other flies. 
but they give them this exquisite control, as you can see from this bee fly and the way it's doing this incredible hovering. No bee could actually fly like that. Um, there are lots of different types of flies eating lots of different things. We, uh, the mouth parts are quite often modified into this strange little dabbing structure. It's actually a highly specialised uh, mouth part in the flies. They can often vomit up, it's often described, that's a bit unfair, but they can extrude enzymes onto the food to digest the food and then suck it back up. And of course some of the flies that hang around your house and do that on your food you're not very happy with. Um, but they also, a lot of them feed on nectar as adults. You see lots of different types of hoverflies. And of course hoverflies are famous for being mimics of the bees and wasps and that's just to keep predators away from them. They don't have a sting but a predator might not wish to take a chance and some of that mimicry is really really clever. So one of the most uh, interesting things I found in my garden very recently was this Narcissus fly. And when I first spotted it, I thought it was a worker of the large red-tailed bumblebee. But I thought it's really agile for a bumblebee, so that made me look closer. And you can see it's an amazing mimic. So most flies will hold their wings out a much higher angle to the body. Uh, so about 45 degrees is the classic thing. But this fly has even learned to put its wings further back over its body. So that mimicry is really very 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 good indeed. In at number one, did you guess it? It's the Hymenoptera. Those are the ants, bees and wasps. And Hymenoptera means membranous wing and they have two pairs of membranous wings that are often zipped together to act as a single wing. The ants, of course, are only winged for the reproductives, for dispersal. They then, the worker ants, are not, uh, are not winged. Most ants you see around your garden, of course, don't have wings. Let's have a quick look at a diagram then. This is Pandora's beautiful drawing of a honeybee, a very familiar insect uh, for most gardeners. And here you can see the two pairs of membranous wings. One of the key things about hymenopterans is they always have a really good waist. So between the thorax and the abdomen, they always really go in there. And then some wasps, it's really highly pronounced, that waist. They're often also really busy looking. They look really intent. They almost look intelligent. They're often waving and waggling their antennae really madly. And that's because a lot of them are parasitic and they're hunting for prey the whole time. And you can see a little braconid wasp here that's waggling its antennae like mad as it searches around for aphids to parasitize. So again, hymenopterans are generally very valuable to gardeners. What about the mouth parts? Well, a lot of them do have chewing mouth parts, but the bees have been specially modified to have these um, sucking mouth parts to enable them to lap up nectar. And of course, hymenopterans are really famous for something called eusociality. And eusociality is a, an evolutionary transition to a new way of living in which individuals, some of them do not reproduce. Instead, they give their labor to help their siblings or their mothers reproduce. So you have a huge number of individuals who are not going to have any offspring themselves, but help to rear the offspring of related individuals. Of course, the ants are famous for that, or honeybees, bumblebees. Not all hymenopterans are social like that, but it has evolved several times within that group. And the flexibility of the mouth parts are such that, for example, in a big ant colony, you'll have the soldier ants with gigantic jaws, some of them no longer able to eat, they actually have to be fed by the workers. So that just tells you about the flexibility of the insect body plan has really been key to their success. And you can see that across the orders, how they're all specialised for different ways of living and they can occupy every niche on this planet, more or less. So the last thing I have to do is to pick my big five, my bug five. That means one individual species to represent each of those five groups. And they have to be things I've seen in the garden this year already. So some things I quite like to cheat and choose, but I haven't seen them, so I can't. For the bug, I'm going to pick the green shield bug. For the lepidoptera, the what? Moths and butterflies, I'm going to choose the peacock butterfly. It's really such a stunning insect. For the beetles, the coleoptera, I'm going to pick the rose chafer. I haven't shown it in this video yet, but here it is. I think you have to agree that is a stunning insect. 
for the flies, I think it has to be a hoverfly. And I'm going to pick that Narcissus fly, which is the incredible mimic of the large red-tailed bumblebee. And for the Hymenoptera, I'm going to pick the large red-tailed bumblebee because I'm not surprised that fly is trying to mimic that insect. The, the queens of the large red-tailed bumblebees are some of the insects I enjoy seeing most. And finally, I actually managed to get some film of one of them. And here it is. Now, as well as my bug five, I've asked entomologist Liam Crowley to do the same. So here he is with his bug five, and you can decide which you think is better. Hello, I'm Liam Crowley, and I'm a postdoc in the Department of Zoology, and I'm going to give you my own personal garden bug five. So to start off with, with Coleoptera, I'm going to go for the common cockchafer beetle, also known as a May bug, because it is May and they're starting to come out now. These are... Uh, very large charismatic beetles and as you can see here have these fantastic lamellate antennae. Then for Hymenoptera my nomination would go for none other than the European Hornet Vespa Crabro. These are uh, absolutely fantastic wasps which don't get enough appreciation uh, if you watch them they're unbelievable hunters and uh, they're not as aggressive as well as, as their reputation uh, sometimes suggests they might be. Then for Lepidoptera, I'm going to go for the aptly named Garden Tiger Moth. This is a, a stunning species, as you can see, and unfortunately has declined in the recent times and is not as widespread as it used to be. Then for Diptera, my, one, my choice would be the uh, Bee Grabber. So these are absolutely fantastic flies, really, really cool. Uh, they're actually parasitoids of bumblebees and mining bees and what they do is they grab hold of the bee in flight and then use their tin opener like ovipositor and slice open the poor bee's abdomen and lay their eggs straight inside them. A very cool little fly. And then finally for Hemiptera I had to choose an aphid just because aphid biology is so unbelievably cool. Uh, things like telescoping generations and the ability to clone themselves and rapidly uh, increasing population size. So I've chosen the sycamore aphid, which if you have a, a sycamore tree in your garden, then you will also almost certainly be able to find the sycamore aphids on the, on the leaf buds this time of year.